Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ma wa ala amma ba'd. Let me begin by welcoming everyone here to our second week, uh, examining virtues on reciting the Qur'an. Um, today's hadith is a very uh, momentous and very beautiful hadith like last week's that gives us a an idea of the gravity of the matter of how important this Qur'an is. And it's a hadith that's not really found in the six works of hadith nor the nine works of hadith. So it's, it's in some of the more obscure collections of hadith which are not that known for being uh, authentic. However, this narration is authentic. This hadith is narrated by the companion Abu Shuraik al-Khuzai radiallahu anh, as well as by another companion Jubayr ibn Mutarn. Um, and it's recorded by al tabarani Ibn Hibban, uh, Al-Bazar, and others. Uh, Abu Shuraif Al-Khuzari says one day that the Prophet Sallallahu he came to us and he said, Abushiru, Abushiru, Alayza tashhaduna an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah. So he said to his companions one day, Rejoice, rejoice, Abushiru, Abushiru. Alayza tashhaduna an la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah. Do you not testify that uh, there is no deity worthy of worship of Allah and that I am his messenger? Do you not testify? So in other words, you're saying, don't you testify to the kalima? La ilaha illallah Muhammad or Rasulullah. And the companions, what did they say? They said, of course we do, O messenger of Allah. Bala ya Rasulullah. Of course we do, O messenger of Allah. And then he said, but inna hadha al-Qur'an tarafuhu bi yadillah wa tarafuhu bi aydikum tarafuhu bi yadillah wa tarafuhu bi aydikum fa innakum fatamassaku bihi fa innakum lan tadillu wa lan tuhliku ba'dahu abada so he said verily this Qur'an one part of this Qur'an is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one portion of the Qur'an is in your hands so hold on to this Qur'an and you shall never deviate after that, nor shall you ever be destroyed after that. So again, as we mentioned, this is a hadith from At-Tabarani and others, and it's a hadith that's authentic, and the scholars have deemed that it's authentic, analyzing it from its chain of narrators. Among the scholars that deemed it authentic, Al-Hakim, uh, Al-Mundiri, Al-Haythami, and from the contemporary time, Sheikh Nasruddin Al-Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Um, so, this beautiful hadith, let's take, take a moment to reflect over what is happening here and what happened with the companions and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Among the things that we learn from this hadith, from uh, the two components we find in this hadith, one of the components teaches us the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it comes to teaching. He was a master teacher. He was someone who knew how to get his message across and he knew how to com communicate. And some of the things that we learned, for instance, <clears throat> what did he do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's a beautiful narration. And he could have just told the companions what he wanted to tell them. But he set the stage. He prepared them. And then he gave them their information. So he communicated to them and stated. So among the things that we'll work through what happened here are some of the techniques of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it comes to um, teaching his companions and his students. And it's something that's very beneficial for teachers and those who are involved in teaching their children or others. Um, among the things that he did, he set the stage for a sort of announcement. So he didn't just speak to the companions, but he wanted to prepare them. So the kind of language that he used and the tone that he set, it was kind of like preparing them for a, a, a great announcement, a proclamation. So he began by saying, Abushiru, Abushiru. So the first thing that he did was rejoice. He said to them, rejoice. In other words, he was telling them about good news. Tell them, rejoice, abshiru, abshiru. Um, and this is something that's in keeping with the mission, the mission of the Prophet wasallam. The Qur'an refers to his message and his mission again and again. And among the words that the Qur'an uses, bashiran wa nadira. Someone who brings good news and someone who warns people. These are the two aspects of his mission. Bashir is bringing the glad tidings to those who accept his message. Nadir means to warn. Uh, being a warner to those who reject his message. So these are the two aspects of this Prophet's message and every single Prophet's message or their methodology that they came to this earth to warn people and they came to the earth to give them good news. And if you look at the Qur'an itself, 
and the, the order of, of, of the usage in the Quran, the majority of times when the Quran mentions his message, it begins with Bashir and then refers to Nadi. In other words, his message is to bring good news and also to warn people. And the implication is that Bashar, or giving glad tidings and good news, is more important than warning people. It's an order of priority. Some of the verses do mention Nadi before mentioning Bashir, but generally those verses are in the context of uh, referring to those people who reject the message or in the context of shirk um, and what have you. So the majority of times the Quran mentions um, and among the verses Ya ayyuhal nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira wa da'yan ila allahi bi idnihi wa sirajan munira O Prophet of Allah, we have sent you as a witness over people and a bearer of glad tidings, giving good news and someone who warns people and he called her to Allah's way by his permission and a shining lamp. These beautiful set of verses teach us um, the role of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is in the second verse, the summary of all of that is Da'iyam ila Allahi bi'idnihi, a caller to Allah's way by his permission. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, first and foremost, he was a Da'i. That is the one word that encapsulates his message and it tells us in one word what his message was. And then Allah mentions shining lamp at the, at the end, just as a metaphor to describe who he was and how he brought light to people. But in any event, the point is, giving good news, Bashara, very, very important. And the Prophet ﷺ, he always he advises his students to give it this order of priority. In other words, it's more, uh, it's more urgent that we give good news to people. It's more urgent that we give them optimism. It's more urgent that we, we motivate them, we inspire them. And warning them and scaring them about you know, what's to come and what to those who reject the message is less of a priority. It's there, but it comes number two after uh, giving them the motivation. So the Prophet wasallam he began by saying, Abshiru, Abshiru, as he often did. And he was setting the stage for something very great. And the second, the third thing, so we mentioned that he began with the tone of an announcement. He didn't just jump into his message. Uh, secondly, he mentioned good news, motivating the people. Abshiru, abshiru, be happy, rejoice, be happy. So the companions, you know, their, their excitement was building. What is he about to tell us? What are we supposed to be happy about? And the third type of technique, he repeated it twice. Abshiru, abshiru. So repetition is a prophetic technique in teaching. Oftentimes he would repeat his message again and again. Those things that were important, sometimes you would repeat them two times or three times. So that kind of gave the gravity and the emphasis to, to the message. Um, among the things that he did was he mentioned the kalima. أَلَيْسَ تَشْهَدُونَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Do you not testify that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah? And that I am His messenger? In other words, the kalima. This is what defines believers. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So sometimes when something was so great, so momentous, that he would, the Prophet وسلم, he would bring the kalima into it. And when he brought the kalima into any discourse, any discussion, it increased the gravity and the seriousness of that to such a level. Sometimes he would say, La ilaha illallah, and the companions would look up and he would teach them something. So here he was saying, do you testify that there is no being worthy of worship but Allah and that I am his messenger? And the companions said, of course. So this, these are some of the techniques of, of the Prophet. And among the things that he did, he asked them a question. And he waited for their response. He didn't just say, say la ilaha illallah and get into the message. He said, do you testify that there is no being worthy of worship but Allah and that I am his messenger? And he waited for them to respond. And they said, bala ya Rasulullah. So sometimes as teachers, you know, to, you know, people are sleepy, so you say, you know, you can, you can use techniques like that. Get the audience involved. Say, are you ready? And see the response. Or say, assalamu alaikum. Wait for their response. These are the prophetic uh, methodologies of teaching. So these are some of the things that he did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to set the stage, to prepare the companions, to motivate them, to inspire them, and then he gave them a message Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what was that message? He used a very beautiful, very powerful and simple metaphor. He said this Qur'an, verily this Qur'an, part of it is in the hand of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and part of it is in your hand. So he used a visual metaphor, and that was part of his teaching methodology as well. Sometimes to get the point across, the, the, the point of this hadith is the same as the hadith we mentioned in the previous discussion last week. But yet the Prophet is using a metaphor here to drive home the point um, that this Quran that you're holding on to with your physical hands, 
part of it is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and part of it is in your hand. It's a metaphor. And if you think about how beautiful and how powerful that is, it's something that we're holding on to. Something that we can touch with our hands. Something we can hold in front of us, we can see with our eyes. This thing, Allah is holding it at the same time. Part of it is in Allah's hand. Meaning it's the speech of Allah. Last week we saw, Kalamullah, Fadlu Kalami Allahi ala sa'iri kalam. The virtue of Allah's speech over all other speech is like the virtue of Allah of His creation. So here he's saying, verily the Quran, part of it is in Allah's hand, and part of it in your hand. So there's a divine connection here, a link. So if you think about that, there's something so great. The Quran is linked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not part of His creation. It's something that's directly linked to Allah. It's divine, it's in essence. So it's something that's linked to Allah that you can hold on to. And that's something so beautiful. It's, indeed, it's good news. It's, it's great news. It's something if you reflect over it, you realize what a mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed to us. That we have something we can touch with our hands and it's divine in essence. And it's something that's attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's our connection. It's kind of like a rope to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet said, But the Masaku bihi. But the Masaku bihi. So hold on to it. And the word he used, the Masuk, comes from the word Masaka. Masaka in Arabic is to hold. You hold something like this, or a pen is Masaka. You grasp something, hold something. The Masaka is a derived form of Masaka from the fifth form of, of this verb, which means it's a deeper meaning. It's not just to hold, it's not just to hold something, but it's to hold on to something. Not just to grasp something, but hold on to it. You know, hold on to it in your life. It has like a more permanent meaning. So the Prophet was advising his companion, Fata Masaku Bihi. Grab the Quran, hold on to it, and don't let go. That's the implication. Hold on to the Quran and do not let go. And then he gives the final part of the hadith. He says, فَإِنَّكُمْ لَن تَضِلُّوا وَلَن تَهْلِكُوا بَعْدَهُ أَبَدًا For verily, if you do that, if you grab the Quran, hold on to it, you shall never deviate after that, nor shall you be destroyed forever. لَن تَضِلُّوا وَلَن تَهْلِكُوا بَعْدَهُ أَبَدًا you shall never deviate, nor shall you ever be destroyed after that. It's a divine promise. And it's a beautiful promise. And it's a promise that's surely true. Those who hold on to the Quran, those who grasp the Quran, two things they're protected from. One is dalala. And dalala, generally when it's used in the Quran and Hadith, it refers to religious misguidance or deviation from the straight path. So it's used in the sense of guidance. Dalala is deviation from the guidance. So the Prophet فَإِنَّكُمْ لَن تَضِلُّوا You shall never be deviated after that from the guide. Meaning, holding on to the Qur'an, um, you shall be saved from a religious perspective. وَلَن تَمْلِكُوا بَعْدَهُ أَبَدًا Nor shall you be destroyed after the second thing that the Prophet mentioned, you shall not be destroyed. Halak. Halak generally when it's mentioned in the Qur'an, and it's mentioned in, in, in the traditions, it refers to physical destruction. Gen generally the Qur'an uses it to describe the destruction of the previous nation. Some of the nations that uh, rejected their prophet, the prophet Hud, prophet Aad, the Thamud, and all these prophets, they were destroyed. And the word used is halak. So the implication in this beautiful promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that holding on to the Qur'an is the source of your religious guidance and the source of your worldly success. In other words, holding on to the Qur'an, you will be safe in a religious sense and in a worldly sense. In a religious sense, you'll hold on to the straight path. This is the guidance. You won't deviate after that. And in a worldly sense, you will not be destroyed. As a nation, as a people, you will not suffer ultimate destruction like some of the nations suffered before. So the implication is you want to be successful from a religious perspective and from a worldly perspective. You want your deen and your dunya to prosper. You want to be safe in, from your deen, in your deen and in your dunya. The solution is to hold on to the Quran. So in these beautiful words, the Prophet he's advising all of us, his companions, and by extension all of us that we need to hold on to the Quran. The Quran, part of it is in Allah's hand and part of it is in our hands. We need to hold on to it and that's the source of our success and our protection and our safety in this world and the next. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of Quran, Ahlul Quran, and among the people who hold on to the Quran and among people who don't suffer deviation or destruction as a result of abandoning the Quran. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وجزاكم الله خيرا